Good morning, and thank you all for joining us. Florida Agriculture in the Classroom is a nonprofit organization that connects kids to healthy food and Florida agriculture through educational resources, teacher professional development, grants, and other farm to school programming. FAITC has a vision to ensure every student in pre-K through 12th grade education are aware of and appreciate, appreciates agriculture and natural resources in Florida. I am Becky Sponholtz and I am the Executive Director of Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and we are hosting today's virtual farm field trip. Jen Morgenthal, our Education Specialist, is with us today behind the scenes on site at the farm. Tiffany Torres, our State School Garden Specialist, is also with us today and she will be monitoring the YouTube chat. A few Thank housekeeping you, items for you today. <laughs> Most of you are probably used to Zoom meetings where you, are, you have access to turn your video and microphone on and off. Today, we are using Zoom webinar where you will not have those features. If you are able, please rename yourself as your school's name and grade level so that when you guys ask questions, we're able to let everybody know who's asking the questions. We would love for you to ask questions throughout the entire tour and we will get as many of them answered as possible as we learn about the Seminole Tribe of Florida. To ask a question, you will use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. You will, you will see that the chat feature has been disabled and you will just be using the Q&A. Any questions that we do not have time for will be answered via email after the tour. If you are joining us on YouTube today and have questions, just type them in, into the chat section and we will be monitoring that as well. At this time, I'm going to pass this over to Jack to start our tour. Hello, my name is Jack Chow. I'm a member of the Jack, wait, I'm also a bird clan. Jack, I'm going to have you pause and, for a second. And I work for the tribe as an, I'm one of the archaeologists for the small tribe. And right now, go ahead. Jack, Jack, sorry to interrupt you, Jack, but we're having yes. connection issues. Yes. Can you, I think we're having a little <laughs> bit of connection issues. Give me a test real quick. Testing one, two, three. Okay, much better. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to have you start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. My name is Jack Chalfin. I'm a tribal member. I come from the Brighton Reservation, and I'm a, also a member of the Bird Clan. Uh, I work for the Seminole Tribe as one of the archaeologists that works for the tribe, and we do archaeology work on all the reservations and off the reservations. Today, we're standing on the McDaniels Ranch, which is a ranch that the tribe owns, and it's approximately 4,000 acres, and the tribe owns like for, uh, you know, there are other ranches too, because there's the McDaniels Ranch, we have the uh, St. Thomas Ranch, Parker Island, and now the Rio Ranch. And then plus they have the reservations, which are the Hollywood Reservation, Coconut Creek Reservation, Big Cypress Reservation, Immokalee Reservation, Brighton Reservation, Fort Pierce Reservation, and we now have Tampa and Lakeland Reservations. Well, to give you a brief history of the tribe, the name Seminole originally came from the Spanish, which was, they pronounced it as Cimarron, which was more like uh, wild people or free people. So basically that's where the name Seminole came from. Now, there's, according to the US history, they say that you know all the people in Florida died off and then the people from the Creek Nation migrated down. Well, yeah, there was a migration after the Creek Wars, but what happened was is they joined up with the remainder of the people that were left here in Florida. And now that's what we have as the Seminole Tribe of Florida, Mikasuki tribe, tribe of Florida, and the Independent Tribes of Florida. Those are, we are the descendants of those people. Now, culture, what is that culture? <laughs> okay, in my culture, we have a lot of things that we do. Uh, we have uh, what we call, it's a ceremony that we have called the Green Corn Dance. We have that every year. We also have the, uh, we have the building of the Chiquis. And then we have the uh, lineage, which is where we get our clans from. Our clans are passed down through our mothers. And, you know, there's for if the, my mom was a bird clan, so now I'm a bird clan. And that way it's kept in line. And that was how after the wars, they kept from interbreeding because there was only certain clans left here. And one part of our history that we always did was we would always, you know, create gardens. And the reason why we created gardens a lot more during the Seminole Wars was because 
when the army came down, they took the cows away from us. They took everything we had. So basically, we used to build gardens. And what we do is there's a hammock over here. We would clear the inside of it to where you couldn't see what was on the inside. And that's where we planted our gardens. So that is basically how we survived through the wars. Agriculture has always been a part of because we were always attached to the land. We grew things, we propagated things. We would go out, find something that was good to eat, and we would bring it back, and then we would plant the seeds and regrow it. So agriculture has always been a part of the tribe ever since they, man was first created. There were always not gatherers and stuff like that, like a lot of people say. We've always went out and found things and brought them back and planted them and grew them to where we could have them there with us, and we didn't have to go out and look for them all the time. And the way we got into the cattle business, here we got into cows, was back in the, back in the early uh, 1500s, some dates have 1514, some dates have 1521, and then there's another date of 1536. But the date that I remember being told was uh, 1514 was when the first cows arrived here in Florida, which it may have only been three cows, two cows and a bull, but that was when the first cows arrived in Florida. And ever since then, the tribe has always been a part of cattle because we got cattle from when the Spaniards lost the cattle. We went out and gathered them and collected them and held them and stuff like that. During the 1700s to 1800s, uh, there was a man by the name of, he was one of the chiefs in Florida. His name was Cowkeeper. That's what the name they gave him. And he had one of the, he had a herd in Florida and he had the largest herd in Florida, which averaged probably over 10,000 head of cattle. And he had that herd until the first Seminole War. And then when the first Seminole War came down, Andrew Jackson came down, invaded Florida when it was still belonged to Spain. And then he came in and he took, like he said he was looking for runaway slaves, but really he went in and he, what happened was he came in and he went and stole the cattle and destroyed in Indian villages and homes and stuff. And then whatever slaves he caught, they took a lot of the cows back with them. Whatever they could gather real quick, they took back with them to Georgia and Alabama. Well, during the third Seminole War, that's when all the cows got lost because they took every they took all the cows away from them because they thought that was our main food source. But little did they know that we still had gardens inside the hammocks that they didn't see because the soldiers would never walk into a hammock. They would always walk around it or go, or, you know, go away from it because they always believed that they walked into it. They wouldn't come out the other side. Well, and that's uh, that's basically how the history of our tribe goes and to the modern day cattle industry, which I'll get into in a minute. We survived the wars by, hang, by hiding in these cypress swamps and hiding in you know, the woods. It's just like I said, because soldiers never entered the woods unless they absolutely had to. So basically we would hide in these woods, these hammocks and these cypress domes, and they would never show, you know, they would never come in there looking for us. They would stop at the edge or they would just go a little ways in and say, okay, I can't find them and come back out. The Seminole tribe was never conquered. We never signed a peace treaty. So therefore we are the only tribe in the United States that is unconquered. Basically what happened was the civil war came along. So they quit, you know, chasing us and started chasing each other. <laughs> my family, how I, how I got into the cattle industry is my great grandfather, which is Charlie Mico. Back in 1929, there was a herd of cattle that was brought down to Florida from the out west and they were shipped on a train to Cornwell train station, which is north of the Brighton reservation. Well, they, my grandfather and a bunch of the others went out there and gathered those 200 head, which were in very bad shape. And they said like 20% of them died on the way driving them back to the reservation. They said 20% of them died. So it started from whatever was left over from that. And that's how the herds, the, the cattle industry started on the reservation of the modern day cattle industry. And back in 1940 is when the Red Barn, which is like a centerpiece on the Brighton Reservation, it was built in 1940. And that was where the main location of the cattle industry was on the Brighton Reservation until the 1950s, 60s. And then it kind of scattered out and it went to individual owners. And instead of being one, you know, like tribal industry, it started going individually. So it turned out that the Red Barn was built back then. And it was basically almost like a community center. And people would use it for, you know, like go and have parties and stuff like that. And it was, you know, 
And it was taken, done that way until the 1970s when it became run down and kind of almost un, uninhabitable. Well, in what year was the grant? Yes. Okay, in 2014 and 15, we got a grant to restore the Red Barn. And basically what we did is went in, took that money, and we went in and, as the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, and we hired a company to come in and to restore it back to its original state, which means they removed the old tin roof off it, put back the wooden shingles, which used to be on it. And that's how we use that grant money to restore the Red Barn. And today it's still being used for birthday parties, weddings, and all kinds of stuff like that. Sure. What type of produce are you currently growing? Do you seed save? And what traditional food items are you growing? Well, the traditional, well, to grow, what kind of food products are we growing right now? We have orange groves. And there is a small grove somewhere here in, in Big Cypress that they're growing like squash, corn, stuff that's supposed to be traditional. They're growing that here in Big Cypress. And and some of the other things is like uh, there's you know, there's a few people here in Big Cypress who have gardens. They were growing what they call kundi, which is an old root type that they use to make bread. Once you but you have to there's a process to it. I mean it's not you like you can just pick it up and eat it. You have to pick it up. You have to skin it. You have to shave it down. Then you have to wash it several times until the water turns white instead of pink, because if you don't, it's poisonous. So there's a few people that grow it around here and there's other people that have gardens. And then they also have, uh, some of them are growing their own Indian medicines, which they have to gather out of the woods and stuff and then bring it and propagate it at their homes and stuff, which we have some people doing that too. Okay. All right, let's go to the Red Barn video. Brighton Red Barn, with its 13 horse stalls, two storage rooms, and hayloft, had an important role in the Seminoles' cattle ranching heritage and was more than just a structure to house horses. The history of cattle ranching among the Seminole tribe of Florida spans over 500 years. Seminoles herded cattle since the days of Spanish settlers set foot in Old Florida. The Seminoles enjoyed almost 100 years of prosperity, dealing in cattle ranching by selling and trading on the international market. By the end of the long Seminole War, five years of constant battling and displacement had destroyed the thriving Seminole cattle ranching tradition. It would take 70 years until the Seminoles would once again raise cattle on a different level and become the envy of its counterparts. In 1940, a cattle management program was formed, eventually changing from a federally funded program to a self-sufficient tribal program. This led to the purchase of the cattle from the U.S. government on an eight-year contract at a mere $75 a head. As the Seminole Tribe of Florida's involvement in the cattle industry continued to flourish, the supplies for its cowboys and horses were thriving as well. To facilitate these needs, the Red Barn on the Brighton Indian Reservation was one of a number of projects built during the Depression by the Indian Division of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Over the years, the Red Barn may have been battered by the Florida sun, countless thunderstorms and unrelenting hurricanes, but just like the unwavering Seminoles, Decades later, this magnificent landmark has stood its ground on the Brighton Indian Reservation.
Jack, there's a couple questions that have come in and um, Carrie's doing a great job of answering, but just in case people don't have their Q&A up on their screen, um, one of the questions that was asked is what is the current population of the Seminoles in Florida? Uh, approximately 4,500. And somebody, uh, one of the classes asked, um, they really love your shirt. Can you can you tell us about your shirt if it has any? <laughs> well, symbols? this is basically what this is, is a traditional dress shirt, but it's actually a traditional modern because the old traditional ones didn't have this center design. They usually just had this rick rack and stuff all over them. And basically it's a long shirt, which the older ones and the old traditional, they went all the way down to your past the knees and they would just tie a belt around their waist and that's, what the men would wear. Well, this is kind of like a modern traditional and that's what this is. So the patchwork here is sewn by the women and it's made of several different cloths where they tear them apart and they put them together, put them back together in a different pattern. So that's what this is. This is what you call a patchwork shirt. And this is a modern traditional because it's long down here, but yet it's got a new pattern on it instead of just the rick rack on it. Well, it's beautiful. Uh, there are eight here. different clans. And then there are eight different clans. You have the otter, you have the bear, you have the deer, you have the wind, big town, bird, panther, and snake clan. Uh, panther clan is your biggest clan because um, they're, they're the largest so far. Uh, there are some clans that are not around anymore because they were either, they died out or were killed during the wars. One of them is like the alligator clan. And then they had the, uh, they did have a wildcat, a tiger, and a bobcat clan, but they've all been included because they were all so small back into the panther clan. So that's basically how that happened. But yeah, there are a couple of clans, and then there's a couple that I don't even, I don't even remember that are not even here anymore. Uh, is the tribe self-sufficient as far as government? Is? Well, the tribe has two branches of government, and the tribe has uh, one of them is the board, board of. Uh, which where it's a Seminole Tribe Incorporated, and the other one is the council, which is the uh, which is the Seminole Tribe Council, and basically the council makes up the rules and regulations, while the board deals with the businesses and the land. The council is kind of like our government that you know does has all that stuff that going on. All right, all right, Jack, can you start um, just to tell us a little bit about what your um, modern cattle, like what does what your cattle industry or operation look like right now? What breeds? Um, all right, right now breed? we have a lot. All right, right now we have a lot of the, uh, what they call brangus. That's what our mainstay is, is brangus cattle. And right now the modern, I mean, we have those ranches that the tribe bought, plus we have the 40 different owners on Brighton, and then we have 28 different owners on Big Cypress. And all total, I would say it's 10,000 plus cattle is what we have for the tribe itself. And where does the, um, does your meat end up in any of the Florida school, school lunchrooms? Uh, basically when we sell on the open market, what we do is we video sell them and then they usually shipped out to either Texas, Oklahoma, or Nebraska. And that's where they go to the feedlots until they're, they fed up to a certain size and then they process them. And that's when they usually go out to your supermarkets, restaurants, schools, and stuff like that. So f most, a lot of people don't know much about the Florida beef cattle industry, but we're definitely a cow calf operation. Can you explain what that means a little bit more? Cow-calf operation is basically where we take the cow and the calf. We have them, we breed the cows with bulls. And then when the calves come along, we raise them up to a certain size. Then they have the video sale. And then we sell them, the calves, to the feedlots. And that's where, you know, it goes out from there. Well, and right now, the ownership of the cattle is, uh, well, the tribe as a whole, owns these like ranches so they're that's owned by the tribe which means it's basically owned by all the tribal members and then the ones that are individual owners are the ones that were passed down when they were split up after the you know the, like the main herd came back in the 20s so basically in the 1940s and 50s is when they split them up to individual owners and it's been the same individual owners or the same descendants from those original owners that are maintaining the cows now um, how many head of cattle do you have 
on on all reservations, all the different land across the state. All different lands across the state is probably I'd say close to twelve thousand, but we just say ten thousand plus. And what other wildlife? We definitely have a lot of, of cool wildlife here in Florida, but what kind of wildlife do you see there on the reservation around the cattle? Uh, right here on the Big Cypress Reservation, we have a lot of panthers and bears that come out here. So basically, like today, yesterday we came out here, there was cows here. Today, the cows are not here. They're hiding in the woods because apparently there was a panther that came up and bothered them last night or tried to get them last night. And they <laughs> broke through a fence and went out in some, somewhere closer to dogs. So they could, you know, so the dog, because panther doesn't like a dog. They hear the dogs bark. They won't be around too long. So basically, that's what the cows did. They went somewhere closer to the, to the dogs to get away from the panther, even though, you know, they use dogs to chase the cows. But they're like, OK, we know over there, at least the panther won't come that close to us. So basically, that's why we don't have cows today standing out here is because they were chased last night by a predator. And the funny thing is, is you know, people say, oh, bears, you know, they're nicer. You know, panthers, they're, you know, they're, well, they're nice and all that. Well, it's approximately 20 percent of our herd that gets lost to predation by them. But if you look at it, if you take a thousand head, yeah, that's 20 head, 20 head of cows you just lost. You might have already said this, but what percentage of your calves on average do you lose every year due to the bears and the panthers? Uh, I have lost probably about five a year. And what? Oh, five percent a year. OK. Yeah, mine is five percent. But down here in Big Cypress, it's, it's about 20 percent. Okay, so different parts of the state, we have a little bit more problems. Yes. You have uh, to remember down here in Big Cypress, this is where they uh, transported all the Panthers <laughs> when they cut, when they catch them out like in Palm Beach or somewhere like that. They bring them out here and turn them loose in the Big Cypress Preserve. So what they're just adding to it is what they're doing. Um, Jack, we had a question come in a little bit ago that said, um, when the Seminole Indians were discovered, what were the numbers before uh, the wars and the Spanish invasion? Before the wars and Spanish invasion, it was approximately uh, 250,000 people were here in Florida. Because you had these big mound complexes and all, like over in Fort Center, where there was estimated, you know, I think there was like 3,000 people were estimated to live there. Big Mound Key, there was an estimated 6,000 people lived there. And you have all these mound complexes. That's where a lot of people lived at before the Spanish arrived. <laughs> um, another question came through. Um, it says, uh, did the Seminole tribes, do they have chiefs or community leaders? Well, we have uh, reservation leaders, which are called our council representatives and board representatives, and they are elected by the people of the tribe. And I know you mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, but somebody said uh, from Waterleaf Elementary, uh, what crops are grown? And I don't know if she's specifically asking for what crops are grown on, on that reservation where you're located, but I guess in, in all the different reservations, what, what are all the crops that are grown? Well, then most of the time, it's like a lot of the traditional food, which is like your squash, your corn, your pumpkin, and some of the other stuff. But on a bright we have citrus groves, too. And, you know, we're into citrus. And used down here in Big Cypress during the 80s, this whole section on the south, you know, north, uh, west side of the, of the road, that if you, if you drive through there, that all used to be orange groves back in the 80s and 90s. So we were big into citrus. And then on the other side of West Boundary Road, they had a lot of uh, farms in there where they used to grow, you know, like they would grow corn, they would grow uh, green beans, they would grow watermelons, you know, cantaloupe, they would grow all kinds of stuff. So basically we were just kind of like, <laughs> we were always tied to, we were always tied to agriculture. For some reason we're always growing something. Not if it's, whether it's cows or if it's food. Um, so, uh, the tribe right now we do have uh, we used to have an aquaculture we used to have a catfish farm out there on the Brighton reservation but it's closed down and now basically it's in it's turned into our uh, what they call our uh, shell pit so they're into mining for a shell and stuff like that we also have one of those here on the big cypress reservation can you um 
talk to us. So Jen and I got the opportunity to go uh, to the McDaniels Ranch where you are and tour it and learn a lot about the, the, the tribe. Um, so can you explain to everybody um, what, what percentage, like how many tribal members actually live on the reservations and how many live off reservation? Uh, there's only like a 40%, 40 or 50% that live on the reservation. The other 50 percent live off the reservation or in like in Cluiston, Okeechobee, Miami Dade, you know, all those areas like that. There's only about a 40 percent, 40 to 50 percent that live on the reservation because housing is uh, not very, you know, there's not a lot of houses on the reservation. Um, and when we were there, Alex explained to us a little bit about um, some of the tribe members that um, I think he called them traditionalists that still live yes. down. Can you explain um, them and where they live and how they live? Well, the traditionalists are the ones who didn't want to be associated with the uh, Miccosukee tribe or the Seminole tribe of Florida. So they continue to live like south of here in the Big Cypress Preserve and also Everglades National Park. And they still live traditionally in Chickies and stuff like that. Except they do have modern things like cars and stuff so they can go buy groceries and stuff. Um, and one of the things that... <laughs> Um, oh, somebody asked, what is a chickie? Can you explain that again? And, and we'll show you some <laughs> pictures. I would like to invite Carrie in on that one. <laughs> okay, well, a chickie is uh, basically, it's a structure that was built out of site. We build them out of cypress poles is what we do. We go in here and we cut down the cypress trees. We skin the bark off of them. Then we bury the poles in the ground. Then we make a roof over top of it. And then we've used the... Palm, palm fronds, which are called sable palm fronds, but we call them fans, and we'd cut them, and then we'd nail them on top of it, and that's basically building a waterproof structure, and that's basically what we used to live in. And also, one of our people who are working with us today, Carrie Dilly, has a book on a chicky. <laughs> That's Roofs and Open Sites is the name of the book. If anybody else has questions, go ahead and keep typing them in because um, eventually we're going to pass that headset over to Carrie, but we don't want to do that until there's all the questions have been answered. Any other questions? Um, this was just an interesting thing that Jen and I learned while we were down there. So those of you guys that live in central Florida, you know that the mosquitoes are terrible. Um, so back before bug spray, how did people um, deter mosquitoes? Well, around the camps and stuff, you use the smoke of the fire because you always had a fire burning in the center camp. And you use that smoke and that smoke music keeps the mosquitoes away. But there are plants out here that grow wild that they also use for uh, repellent when they were off away from camp, which I don't know the name of them, but <laughs> there's a um, few people who still know it. Uh, I, I think we were also told, too, that is it bear fat that people used to? Some of them used to use that, too. <laughs> That, that just seemed amazing. Um, so a question um, came in. Do Seminoles have a language that is still spoken? Yes, there's uh, two different languages here in the state of Florida. One of them is called the Muscogee language, which is also known as Creek language, which it's, uh, you know, associated with the ones in Alabama and Georgia. But yeah, that, there's a language and mostly that one is spoken on the Brighton Reservation. Then down south here on the Big Cypress and Mockley and the uh, Hollywood reservations, they all speak what we call the uh, Miksiki language. And this was not a question that came up, but this is just a question uh, for me. I, I know that there's a charter school um, on the reservation, but do you have um, tribal schools that teach the, the you know, the young, the, the, um, the history and the languages to keep it going? Yes, the uh, Fajki school, they teach Miksiki language. And then the uh, Pimietta, which we, Pimietta School, which is called the Brighton Charter School, it's called, it's pronounced Pimietta and Mahaga, which means our way of learning. And that's the name of the school, but that school, they teach the Muscogee language at that school. So they have uh, in what they call an immersion program in both schools. Once you walk through the front door of that, you do not speak English anymore. You have to speak the languages. Um, another question came in. What are responsibilities that are used today to protect your land? How do you protect it? 
Well, basically, like we have Alex and these two get people behind us over here on the UTV. They're the ones who patrol this area, and they also, you know, they use they 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 manage this and take care of this ranch. So they're kind of like the caregivers, protectors of this ranch. And if they need to, they also have the law enforcement, which is just right down the road. They can call them and they can come out there and help them with whatever needs to be taken care of. We got two great questions and I'm excited for you to answer this. Can you describe what your childhood was like as a Seminole? My childhood? Well, growing up, I grew up in one of the, I grew up in a small camp at the beginning of my childhood. And that was like the first five or six years of my life. It was a camp that I lived in. And basically it was, you would wake up in the morning and you got to see the sunrise and, you know, cause you, <laughs> you were inside the chicky and there was no walls on it. So you slept under that and that's, uh, you woke up in the morning, you saw the sunrise, you got up, you did whatever chores you had to do, or, you know, like clean camp or whatever. Then they cook breakfast and after breakfast, the most of the adults went to work. So basically my childhood growing up when I was that age, was more about being spending time with my grandparents and my mom and we would go out and either we would you know collect stuff or we would gather stuff or or we would go work in the fields they would go work in like tomato fields and they would go work in watermelon fields so me and my brother kind of got drugged along and that's where we spent like the first four or five years was out in the fields working or out doing stuff like that and then when we got back if we had time to play we would run out in the woods we, they would tell us to go to the next hammock over so, you know, because, you know, there was a hammock next to our hammock. And so we would run over to the hammock and we would go and play whenever we had daylight long enough. Because in the summertime, you know, don't get dark till almost nine. So we'd run over there and start playing, doing stuff. And the funny thing is, is one, one hammock we always went to, there was these little flat gray rocks. And we used to throw them at each other as our bullets where we'd play war. So I mean, we would do that. And then it, I got a job with the uh, Tempo in 2013. Well, come to find out, they wanted to go survey the hammock for doing an archaeological survey. And I was like, okay. They were like, do you know how to get there? I said, yeah. I said, I know how to get there. I said, I'll show you a way. I said, how when you run this dry? You know, when it's wet, you can't, when it's wet, you can't get to it because it's almost isolated. But when it's dry, you can drive up to it, you know, drive up to it. But I knew a way that you could get close enough to where it was only like 50 yards you had to walk till you got into the hammock. So we drove up there and we got out there and we started walking into this hammock. And the archaeologists that were with me, they were looking around and they started, you know, getting real excited and stuff. And they started picking up these flat gray rocks and, you know, taking points like, where, you know, the spot where it was at. And they were collecting them. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? And they're like, oh, these, uh, this is pottery. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah. So, well, if y'all were here during this, you know, the early uh, 70s and, uh, you know, early 70s and stuff, I said, y'all would have had a lot more of it. They're like, why is that? Because we used to pick these things up and throw them at each other's bullets. Um, that was great. Uh, so K through <laughs> Elementary and YouTube also asked, um, can, how do you say hello in both languages? Well, in uh, the Mexican, I'm not in the Creek language, it's uh, Stongo is hello. And Mexican, I don't know how to say that one. You know, Alex? Okay. Mixuki, say hello. No, <laughs> no, we don't know that one. <laughs> um, and how many generations of your family are currently active on uh, the reservation? This comes from Palm Bay Academy. Uh, my generation, my my family, there is uh, four generations. Um, this one's kind of a very open-ended broad question but somebody says is it hard to be a farmer so we'll put that into the aspect of cattle ranching like how hard is it to be a cattle rancher well there's a saying that if you're a cattle rancher you wake up before dawn to get started because you never know what today is going to bring you so you have to work through surprises and you have to work through whatever the day comes whatever comes along during the day and by the time you get done with everything, working cows, taking care of the cows, feeding them, you know, doing whatever's got to be done. At the end of the day, you're usually coming home after dark. And behind you to your right is a big, big something, a bucket, a trough, a trough, maybe. Actually, it's a uh, molasses tub. Is, OK. And why do you um, what is the molasses for? The molasses is a supplement that we put out here, especially during the wintertime, because when freezes the grass dies off and the kid has not like no value that's uh you know it doesn't grow very good during the winter time so we give the cows mineral 
I mean, uh, molasses, and it makes them eat the grass. So therefore, at least they're getting something out of it. Is grass their main diet there? Grass, molasses, and mineral is basically what we use. Okay. Um, another question came in. I'm sorry, we're kind of jumping all over the place. Um, <laughs> what is a typical breakfast for uh, Seminoles? Is there a specific type of food that you guys eat? Well, it's going to sound funny, but there's a lot of these spam and egg in the morning. <laughs> it's a traditional food, one of the usual foods, breakfast foods, bacon and egg, sausage and egg. But usually it's sometimes it's on fry bread. If you're lucky, it's on fry bread, not regular bread. <laughs> um, what important buildings are on the reservation? Important buildings. Hmm. There's not really many important buildings. The only like important buildings we have is the Red Barn, and the other one is called the Council Oak. And it is an oak tree where the tribal members, tribal people used to meet. And they used to meet with the BIA back in the day, and that was how where they, writ, they wrote the constitution of the tribe to get us incorporated. And that's how we came up with our branches of government. And that was back in the 1950s. And that oak tree stands as one as, as, a, as a, what do you call it? Yeah, it's on the National Register. It's Council Oak and the Red Barn. It's the only two ones we have. Um, and that same question was, uh, how old is the reservation? The one here on Big Cypress is 1920s. The one in Brighton is in 1929, 1930, or 30, and it says 1930 or 36 on some of the paperwork. Uh, the Hollywood Reservation, the Daniel, what they used to call the Daniel Reservation, is the same age as Big Cypress. And, and did you mention at the beginning that you are, um, there, there's a, another reservation being added right now or recently? Yeah, Lakeland. Lakeland is just being built. They're putting houses on it now. Okay. And the third question on that same one is, um, do you speak another language? Which I know you said hello in one of the languages. Are you fluent in? I'm not real fluent, but I can understand it. I, you know, I grew up and I grew up with my grandparents, with them. So I basically had to learn <laughs> learn how to understand them when they talked. <laughs> Um, and are there any females that are nominated as council leaders? Yes, we have uh, one here in Big Cypress. Uh, she's what's uh, James Billy's daughter. What's her name? Marianne Billy. She is a uh, council rep. And at one time, we also had Betty Mae Jumper. She was a chairman of the tribe back in the was it, 60s, 60s or 70s. Yeah, she was the chairman of the tribe back then. Um, there, a question came from YouTube. What is your favorite traditional food or food from the reservation? I have traditional favorite food. That's kind of hard to say, but one of them I always like to try to eat is it's called pork chop on fry bread. <laughs> but the other one that is also like a lot of swamp cabbage too. Can you explain what swamp cabbage is and that type of bread that you're speaking of? Swamp cabbage is basically, you see the young palm there growing right there? That's basically swamp cabbage. You go in there, you cut it down, uh, cut it down below with a certain point. And inside of it, it's called heart. They call it in, uh, I don't know what country it is, but they call it heart of palm. And basically that's what this is. It grows wild and natural out here, but down there they have to grow it, you know, and they have to cultivate it to get it to, so they can harvest it. But here it grows wild everywhere. And what about that bread? What, how is it made? What is it made up of? Bread is, the fry bread is basically, uh, what did you take flour, water, and then mix it together and you use self-rising flour. And then they would take that and they would pat it out into little patties and then it would throw it in hot grease and fry it. Um, a question from Waterleaf, I believe, came through. How many Seminole Wars were there and how many were won and lost? Uh, according to the uh, United States government, there was three wars. But if you ask our elders and stuff, they would say it was long, one long war because the three different wars in the United States government was nothing but three different policy changes. And what, what kind of tools or materials were used as weapons during those wars or war? 
During those wars, the uh, first one, we basically we had the bows and arrows, the laddles and stuff like that, and some weapons because the Spanish Spanish gave us some weapons and stuff like that, some guns, which were the old musket types, and that's basically what the three wars were fought with: muskets, stuff like that. Um, the, a question came through: uh, this, Are any uh, Seminole Indians vegan? That's a, that's a funny question. Well, back in the day, they used to say if you, you know, if you were a Seminole who didn't like any meat products or didn't have any meat, they called you a bad hunter. <laughs> so that's what, <laughs> that's what they say a vegan is. If you're a Seminole and you're a vegan, you're just a bad hunter. Um, uh, do you grow crops? all year and i know in florida we're a little bit different depending on where you live but um do you grow crops all year uh watermelons cantaloupes stuff like that usually grow during the summer springtime and then during the fall time they usually start going into tomatoes green beans and stuff like that then the winter time is when they grow their uh, like turnip greens collard greens and stuff like that mustard greens and stuff and that's basically, they, they switch it around a lot. It's not always the same thing. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this question or know the answer. Is, why are some plants named after animals? For example, bobcats. Uh, because it, I guess it would be more like they would uh, image it. It looks more like the image of a bobcat or the image of the tail or the image of the ears or something. Any that's other? like that's like that's like young ferns. They call them fiddleheads because it looks like a head of an old fiddle. <laughs> Which those are edible though. You just gotta have them when they're still curled. Any other questions before we go? Or any last thing you want to tell us about before we switch over to Carrie? And uh, I think I'm about all a breath here. <laughs> all right. Well, go ahead and hand the set over to Carrie, which she can te tell us a little bit more. All right. All right. So, well, yeah. So, Carrie is going to tell us a little bit about. Um, who she is, what she does, and more resources for you guys as teachers. Sure. So my name is Carrie Dilley, and I'm currently the uh, Marketing and Advertising Coordinator for Florida Seminole Tourism. Um, and before this role, I actually worked at the Athothiki Museum right here on the Big Cypress Reservation. Um, and then before that, I worked for the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. So um, I've been very lucky to spend over 13 years working for the Seminole Tribe and, you know, just absorbing all this incredible history. Um, you know, I'm always willing to learn every single day. And especially in my role at the museum, um, I was able to help bring um, a lot of this information to the general public. So um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that um, typically the museum would be open for tours. Now I understand that, um, you know, some of these groups on the line today are from all over the country perhaps, or are from all over the state. So if you're not able to visit in person, which, um, Side note, the tours are still a little bit on hold right now. Um, hopefully in the new year, those will resume. Um, but if you're not able to visit the museum in person, you can visit online. Um, and I think the website is going to be dropped in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and, you know, the, the staff there, they're incredible. They're always willing to answer questions. Um, and, you know, they support a lot of research projects. So just a little bit about the museum um, really quickly. It was um, built in 1997. And the first director was Billy L. Cypress, um, who was, of course, a Seminole tribal member. 
And just recently, his nephew um, took over as the new director. So that's really exciting um, that it's staying like as a family legacy. Um, but the museum is really there, first of all, um, to serve the community. And then um, second of all, to you know serve visitors who come and want to learn more about Seminole history, culture, traditions. And one of the questions that showed up um, in the Q&A was, you know, what can you do um, to support, you know, the Seminole cattle operations or, you know, what can you do to support the Seminole tribe? And, you know, the museum is really an incredible place to be able to do that. And even if you can't visit in person, just going on the website and, you know, learning and for all students to understand that Seminole history is Florida history and um, just understanding that importance and not thinking just about the Seminole War era or, you know, that the Seminole um, culture stops thriving after a certain point and just understanding that, you know, there are over 4,000 Seminole tribal members today and their issues are critical. They, they should matter to all of us. So I think that's, you know, something really important to always keep in mind and, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, or anybody at the museum if you have questions. Uh, we have curriculum on the museum's website, you know, activity packets, um, different learning resources for all grade levels, really. And, um, the museum has over 180,000 objects in the collection, and many of those are available um, to search online. So if you go to the museum's website and you go to collections and online collection, you can see, um, you know, photographs, historic photographs, paintings by Seminole artists. Um, there's a really cool feature on there called like random images or something like that. And I think that's just a great place to get started just to kind of, um, you know, understand like the breadth of resources there. And also, you know, for learning about what's happening in the tribe today, the Seminole Tribune, um, which is the newspaper, it's incredible. So I would highly recommend um, checking out SeminoleTribune.com or .org. Um, so you can check out the current issues of the newspaper online. So that's another great place to really like delve into um, these issues. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Jack, for, for taking the time today to join us and, and giving us a little bit of uh, history and information. Um, and thank you to Alex, who toured uh, Jen and I a few months ago while we were there. Um, even though I didn't, I was a little nervous about the bears and the panthers. It was really interesting and really beautiful. Um, so those of you guys that are still with us, if you could take the, the post uh, tour survey that we put into the, the chat. Um, and we are going to have two more tours at the beginning of um, next year. So hopefully January, February. So stay tuned and check out our website. So thank you guys so much. And we hope you guys enjoyed it.